Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Karen Garza, and I'm the president and CEO of Battelle for Kids, and we're really delighted to have you joining us today. You're in for a real treat because we're gonna we have the opportunity to talk with a wonderful district uh, out of Virginia, and some of their school leaders, school district leaders, that are with us today, uh, and really talking about how do you bring your take your portrait of a graduate or your part, portrait of a learner, whatever you call your 21st century vision, and how do you bring it to life with a high quality. Uh, innovative um, strategic plan. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, and we're excited to have that opportunity. For those of you that are not familiar with Battelle for Kids, we're a national not for profit. Uh, we've been in existence for about 23, 23 years, and we're headquartered out of Columbus, Ohio. But we have the good fortune to work with about 290 to 300 districts per year uh, and state agencies across the country. And um, we've been, we're just, uh, we love the opportunity and we feel very fortunate to have the opportunity to work with so many innovative school systems um, across the country and uh, supporting them and how they're advancing uh, their vision for, for children and for education. So uh, today our purpose uh, is to provide you a little bit of an overview around how we approach a strategic planning process. And we had the good fortune uh, to be a partner uh, with Albemarle Schools and how they've approached their strategic plan. So we're going to focus on how, how that worked for them uh, from their perspective. Uh, our planning strategic planning process is represented in this um, picture uh, that's on your screen. Uh, but the most important part about that is our strategic planning process is grounded in the first part of the, the process, which we think is the ultimate and most important part, which is the defining of this really inspiring and forward-thinking uh, vision around portrait of a graduate. What are what are what are the hopes, dreams, and aspirations that we have for all of our young our students in our community, our young people, in light of how the world is changing? And that is becomes the the grounding for the strategic plan moving forward. So that represents um, that. So today we have three wonderful leaders from Albemarle Public Schools who are with us today. Uh, we have the superintendent, Dr. Matthew Haas. Uh, we have their assistant superintendent for strategic planning, Dr. Patrick McLaugh McLaughlin. And their school board chair, Mr. Graham Page, who's been a school board chair for, I think, six or been on the board for six years and a former classroom teacher, which is really, really cool to have uh, you on the board. So I'm going to turn it over now to Matt Haas and let him tell you a little bit about Albemarle, where they're located, and give you a little context for knowing their district. Thank you very much, Dr. Garza. It's really a pleasure to be here today, and um, I welcome everyone that's uh, joined us. And uh, as we always say, you know, we're we're going to share about Albemarle County Schools. We're not assuming we're doing uh, the greatest work ever. We know there's great work going on everywhere, but this is our journey, and uh, we're, we learn something new every day. And so, Albemarle County Schools, Albemarle County is uh, a county that's in Central Virginia. Um, if you're familiar with Charlottesville, if you've ever come here to visit Monticello, um, we are the county that surrounds uh, the city of Charlottesville. We have uh, just uh, about 13 and a half uh, thousand students, and we have um, uh, four high schools. One of them is a charter school that's a, a lab school. Uh, we have um, five middle schools. 15 elementary schools, and then a series of uh, specialized centers, uh, one that's a technical education center, and then one that's uh, built around um, uh, telecommunications and, uh, and uh, computer technology. Um, we are uh, what, what I would call a barbell uh, school district. We have uh, parts of our county that have extreme wealth, and then we also have an urban ring uh, that's about 35 square miles around the 10 square mile city of Charlottesville that um, has students uh, in, that are underserved. And uh, we are a diverse school system and we have all the, uh, the various challenges that school systems around the nation deal with in terms of uh, students coming in that have um, needs beyond just the everyday day-to-day -day curriculum around language acquisition, overcoming poverty, and, uh, and also overcoming a lot of the the systemic uh, biases that, that are kind of baked into the work that we do. On the surface, when you look at the overall uh, school system where you would say we're successful, I think this time around, even after the pandemic, we still had, uh, uh, we topped the state average in terms of our graduation rate and we were 
had a smaller uh, dropout rate than the state. But when you when you start to look at our uh, results around uh, early reading, uh, math, and all students accessing um, what, what we might call more of our advanced opportunities, that's where we start to see uh, a lot of the work that we have to do to overcome a lot of equity gaps within our division. So I think um, that's a very high level description of our, our county schools. I, I hope that is enough to kind of envision where we are. Um, and if you're ever in town, uh, let us know and you can come by for a visit. Thank you, thank you, Matt. Um, sure. The Albemarle uh, County Schools have been a part of our, our national network, which is Ed Leader 21 for 11 years. So you've been uh, along this journey and really been a leader in our national network for, for so long. So thank you all for your contributions to the network and for your leadership in the work. And as you illustrated, Matt, you know, this is, this is, we're continuing on this journey, all of us are, right, and continuing to learn and, and grow and explore how we can continue to um, make sure that all of our children receive a 21st century deeper learning education and are well prepared for mm -hmm. um, the workforce and well prepared to thrive in their own lives. So thank you all for being with us today. For those of you that are listening in, if you have questions, feel free to pop those in the chat. We'll see if we can get to them. If we don't have time to get to them, we'll follow up with you later uh, with some answers to those questions, but we'll try to the extent we can to, to fold those in now. But I'm gonna ask these wonderful people um, a series of questions so that we can learn more about their experience with strategic planning. Um, and then I have one more background kind of question, Matt, I wanna ask you first to get us started before we get sure. into the details of your strategic plan. Talk with us a little bit about any of the Kind of what you think are uh, the conditions for readiness or any kind of background that you thought was important uh, for our listeners to to know before we get into the actual details of your strategic planning process. Thank you, Dr. Garza. So I would say in terms of the setting for our for our uh, school system, what I think helped set the stage was uh, continuity of leadership is one piece. We've, we've had um, prior to my being superintendent, we had Dr. Pam Moran who uh, had the vision to, we joined uh, Ed Leader 21 uh, under her leadership and really had a, a high level focus on um, contemporary learning experiences and spaces for students and began to shift the focus of the division to not just have students do well on, um, on outcome measures like standardized tests, but also uh, to go after higher order thinking. And prior to her, uh, the superintendent was Dr. Kevin Kastner. And under his leadership, there, we uh, developed something called the Framework for Quality Learning, which was a meta curriculum that uh, you would map the standards of learning, which are Virginia's um, uh, overarching curriculum. We would map those to uh, higher order uh, thinking skills, balanced assessment, uh, really starting to look at essential understandings beyond just the facts. So then as I've, I've been in the county now for, I think, 18 years, coming up from being a principal, sort of getting immersed in that work, then we could carry it forward. And our board, as you can see by the participation of uh, Mr. Page today, is, is well invested in that work. I, I dare say a lot of the presentations that are done and a lot of work that's done, you might not have a board member as part of it, but he, he's in, he speaks the same language we do. He understands, especially being a, a teacher, how important it is to extend students beyond um, just the, the basics. I would say um, our, our strategic plan has a very focused mission, which is to end the predictive value of race, class, gender, and special capacities on student success. And there's some more to that, but I think one of the things that was really critical in setting the stage for us in, in, a, in a not great way was the um, Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville in um, August of 2017. In our community for a long time, there's been a brewing um, community of underserved students uh, and our school system, uh, unfortunately, I think also had, has a lot baked into it that uh, contains systemic bias, racism, um, other issues that we needed to confront. And just like the pandemic has accelerated us in our work around technology and virtual experiences, that 
that riot that, that wreaked havoc in our community and caused, um, unfortunately caused death, uh, also I think was a rebirth for focusing on helping all of our students succeed and not just to su succeed on a standardized test, but to really be part of uh, great learning opportunities, high quality learning opportunities that brought us to, to the point where we, I think we're ready to embrace the broad spectrum of participants who wanted to be part of creating that vision for Albemarle County Schools and also ready and willing to listen to what their needs were moving forward. Thank you. That and and I would say I follow that really closely. I had just left the superintendency um, in Virginia as well. But what was really powerful about what the way you all handled that, you got the students right involved. Mm -hmm. You you didn't um, you know you you knew that the student voice was really important to shaping a future direction as you responded. In fact, I think you put a team of students together to help you think about a board policy mm -hmm. for how you deal with diversity, equity, inclusion. And some of the racism that was that was um, occurring in your community as a result of that riot. So, anyway, congratulations to you all for being so courageous and so bold and and embracing those challenges and trying to find a path forward, which is I think a great model for all of us. Um, so let's get to the strategic plan, and I think we're going to briefly show the a picture of the Albemarle portrait of a learner, which. Um, you know, we're, we're um, I hope you all are very proud of, you should be very proud of that, that work. And then the, the plan that came out as a result of your, of your strategic plan. So that's where I'm going to start with some of the questions. And the first being, um, you know, I, I, like so many school leaders across the country have experienced all kinds of strategic plans. And I find that most of them are real focused on this incrementalism. Let's get a little bit better at this and 3% better at that. And the kind of strategic plans we like to, to help support are these that are real transformational and ones that uh, really define what are the bold moves that we need to make as a system, as a district, to reimagine the future for our organization and our school district and to become something different um, in response to the needs of our, of our students. And we believe that's centered uh, and that work is really grounded most appropriately with the portrait of a graduate being that kind of cornerstone of that work. So, and I think that's really a differentiator. Um, so I would, I would love for any of you to jump in and talk about maybe the contrast between maybe a traditional strategic planning process that maybe you've experienced in other places and a strategic planning process uh, like the one that you embarked upon where it was started with Let's take our portrait of a learner and what are the big moves we need to make to bring that to life for every child in our system? Pat, you want to go ahead with that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, thanks, Dr. Garza. The, you know, that was one of the, as we put this out for RFP, our, our strategic plan was, was winding down. And, and quite frankly, our previous strategic plan really didn't have a whole lot of teeth to it in terms of accountability and, um, uh, and really doing things that were going to push the district to move forward. So we knew we wanted something that was going to be that was going to look a little bit different than what we had. And we we went out to um, to RFP for this uh, to find a partner who could come in and, and help us with the work. And one of the things that that then clearly obviously Patel was the came out as our, our partner for that. And one of the things that really stood out to us was that a lot of folks who came in wanted to jump right in with the current state analysis, right? They wanted to, to, to fix problems that they found within the division. And we weren't really interested in that. We really liked the, uh, the model that Patel brought that, that really said dream first, right? What is it that, so don't worry about where you are, don't worry about your facilities, don't worry about any of those other um, issues that are there, but where do you really wanna be if, if none of those things were a factor? Um, and, and they really helped us focus on community engagement with this. We had um, well over 100 community members uh, who came together uh, to help us start to build that portrait. And, and this was, you know, we started this right as the pandemic was hitting. This was the first time I think we had done one of these uh, via Zoom instead of in person. And, uh, and we, we had a lot of great flexibility with how we could do that. And in fact, I think in some ways it enhanced the process that we uh, that we had, and, and we also thought that this was really important to to be a reflection 
of what was happening right now in our community. And as Matt alluded to, um, Unite the Right was uh, what was a, certainly a, an impactful event that had taken place with us, with our community. We were already, even prior to Unite the Right, having some conversations around a program called Reframing the Narrative, where we were really shifting what was taking place in our social studies classes to give a more, uh, I think, accurate and unbiased view of, um, of American history that was there. And then we also had students who came to us uh, several years ago and said, you know, this, this current model that we have in our high schools really isn't working for us because it's all about competition and being better than the person next to me so that I can be more competitive when I go off to college. And they said, you know, the things that really stand out for us are practices like waiting grades, uh, practices like, um, uh, uh, let's think of something, I'm blanking that, some of the other ones that were, uh, that were out there. But basically they said, we're so tied up taking as many AP classes as we can uh, that, that we don't have time to do anything else. And we would see students who wouldn't take classes uh, that were really of interest to them, that could really build on some of those critical thinking and creativity skills because they were unweighted and they would by default lower their GPA. So we had a lot of students taking study hall saying, man, I wish I could go and take that uh, photography class, uh, but I think it's gonna put me at a competitive disadvantage. And so that became a big factor in our in our plan, and and we started out with uh, with the group really coming together around the portrait of a learner, uh, and and we expected some things to be in there, right? I don't think you see many portraits without things like um, critical thinking and uh, and things like that that are in there. But one of the things that I think really helped us, uh, in that we, we were really able to uh, to do some neat work with Patel around, was that our community clearly wanted to push. To, to some other competencies that they, that they hadn't normally seen, um, specifically things like social justice and inclusion and anti-racism. And, and those are, are very deliberately a part of our portrait of a learner right now. And, and that wasn't without some controversy with uh, members of our community and, um, uh, and, uh, and some, some other stakeholders that we had, but we felt it was important at this time to really uplift those things. And I think we are one of the, the first divisions that have really deliberately said, if you're a part of Albemarle County Schools, this is what you're going to be a part of. Uh, and this is what we're going to do to impact our community. Um, so that portrait of a learner development as that, as that dream first, right, and, and fix later for, um, for lack of a better term, I think was really crucial to us as a part of this process. I like the way you put that because the portrait of a graduate becomes the the way you capture the dr collective dream of the community for its young people, right? Um, and then the strategic plan begins to say to capture the big moves we're going to make to bring that to life. So thank thank you, Patrick, and and Mr. Page that that uh, leads us to you. Patrick talked a little bit about uh, the community involvement in the strategic plan as a board member. Love to get your perspective on the, the extent to which the community was involved and how you felt like it helped shape the, the ultimate outcome and the kind of the community's feeling uh, about this process. Right, it was really important to the board um, for us to have the community completely involved in um, producing our portrait of a learner and also in producing our strategic plan. And uh, once the portrait of a learner had been devised or had been, uh, created. Then we had a team uh, that was sort of responsible for designing and writing our strategic plan. And it was really important to the board, to me and to the board, that we had uh, people from our school division. We tried to have, there was 100 people on the team total. And uh, we wanted about 50% of that to be our staff and personnel from central office. So that would be principals, teachers, some of our uh, classified employees, our cabinet members, and also our department directors. So they were all involved representing the staff. Then we also had about 20% of the um, design team was made up of our current students within the county because we wanted to have their perspective too. And like Patrick mentioned, um, students just before this had also come to us and had helped us to devise an anti-racism policy which was one of the first i think in the country so that was really important to us 
And then we also had a representation from various community members, from different organizations, even from some of the religious leaders in the community. So I think all of them working together sort of really helped. And like uh, Dr. Haas had mentioned, with the things that had happened to on, in August of 2017, that was still really fresh in, I think, all of our minds within the community. So I think that led to those really important parts in our portrait of a, of a learner, of the anti-racism portion and also the social justice portion. I think our community members were really engaged in making sure that what had happened on, in August of 2017 would not happen again. So we really wanted to have that anti-racism and social justice portions within um, our division. And also with our values, even the equity portion, like Dr. Haas had mentioned. So I think having our community um, leaders and our, our design team really representing our community, all of those things really did come out. It would be really important to our community. And they all really did come out in our strategic plan. In some ways, um, this process was somewhat healing, it sounds like. It really was. To your community, would you agree with that? Yes, okay. I really would. Because um, it was really a traumatic experience. And even now, when we hear the news, just hearing the word Charlottesville sort of evokes that idea of what happened here on August 2017. And that's not really our community. And so it was really important to the community members to get out the perception that that, that wasn't really Charlottesville that was happening. That wasn't really, really us. And so I think um, all of our community members that were engaged with this process, probably deep down inside, maybe right on the surface, it may not have been apparent. But I think deep down inside, we all sort of recognized that and wanted to make sure that that was being reflected within the strategic plan. And I, yes. and I think it's important, yeah, go ahead, Patrick. Dr. Garza, to note also that we were very deliberate in, in putting the team together, that we wanted it to be a reflection of our community, which doesn't always happen. You know, that, that we wanted to avoid having the same voices who, who we always hear uh, uh, whenever we do community events or, or ask for feedback be the drivers of the plan. And so that took significant work on the on the team's part to go out and recruit and convince people that we were they were coming into a uh, you know a safe trusting environment where their voice really would be heard uh, and their and their feedback and their comments would be valued um, by us. And I think that was a, really a key to the success of the plan development as well. You know, we're we're finding that even in a time where sometimes it feels like everyone's mad at everybody. You know that there's more um, angst, and that people um, that that there's nothing that we can can bring us together. And we're finding that's actually not the case at all. Uh, without exception, when we go out to communities and we're working with on a portrait of a graduate or even a strategic plan, and sometimes we'll have a superintendent say, you know, "We have a lot of disagreements in this community. A lot of people feel, you know, there's a lot of angst, and I'm worried about it." And then certainly, that's a legitimate worry. But we're finding when you bring them together around these important conversations, it kind of cuts through the noise. And so talk about that. And then also how important it is to have the students at the table. I think uh, so. One other layer, just real quick, uh, that was part of the process was we had our the, the working groups that were together. But before we um, started to really make things a little more concrete, we did do a community wide survey. We had, I think, was it, it was more than 2,000 uh, responses to, which for us is a is a larger response. So we did, you know, we put that out through all of our county um, to kind of get a, a bigger picture feedback. And um, I think that, you know, when it when it comes to students, what what I think's been interesting in responding to the students over time and their involvement in it is it reminded me that they they do watch what we do. And they do hear what we're saying, and they do uh, want to get us moving, uh, and and say, well, you know, you said you all were going to do this particular strategy or take on this uh, project. So when are when are you going to do it? When do we get to be part of it? One of the one of the outcomes of the of the plan, uh, we the one of the things I really like about the plan that's different from the ones we've done in the past is it has. It has a student opportunity, you know, the thriving student component, 
It's got the, it has a focus on all of our resources, our operations. That's a big piece that, uh, that we've left out in the past. And then the really, to me, the probably the most powerful part is the engaging and empowering our communities. And mm -hmm. one of the outcomes of our different way of thinking was students asking us and students starting to solicit and say, when can we be part of the school board? And our school board, as, as part of this process, uh, began to have, was, re, was our board that started having a, a student member. So that became something that our board does annually. They uh, solicit all the high schools for students who are interested in being members and then uh, go through a process. They interview the students. And instead of just having a longstanding one member, they, they cycle through a number of students throughout the year. We engage the student in, in um, reading a spotlight at the beginning of the meeting. And over time, as students have become more comfortable and board members have become, become more comfortable, we're starting to hear a whole lot more from our students. And what I would also say is that um, we focused on having students that represent the broad spectrum of our, of our population. So we, we've left out things like, you know, in the past, when you start something like this, you'd say, well, what's your GPA? And, you know, tell us about all your leadership experiences and all those things. This is really just, are you interested? What, what do you see as the needs of students in the school system? And what, what would you try to accomplish if you were a member of the school board? And then we just, we take it from there and balance the demographics balance uh, gender, balance all those pro you know, different um, aspects of, of students so that we have a, a, have a diverse representation on the board. Pat or Graham? Yeah, just to piggyback on what Dr. Haas said. Um, this year, our applicants were really sort of surprising for our student rep. I think we had probably about 13 or 14 applications. Only one young man um, applied for our positions this year. So they were all our young uh, lady students, but the um, diversity of the applications was really pretty astounding. So we ended up with some really good uh, representatives so far. Each of our representatives serves about three months. And so we've had two so far this year, but they've really been outstanding represent, uh, representatives on the board. I, I, my most recent school district in, in Virginia, we had a student on the school board and that student was selected through our my superintendent student advisory, but um, just it's powerful when you're making policy decisions or you're making decisions that directly impact students and how often their vo voice is not at the table. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty powerful, and I can't tell you how many times that student would speak and everyone would just be in in awe. <laughs> you know, it's almost. It, at this pause, it was kind of interesting because it's like, wow, we didn't really think about that. You know, that's a mm -hmm. different perspective and it helps us make better decisions, doesn't it? It does. Right. That's a great outcome um, of the strategic planning process surfacing these kind of great ideas. I will go to the next question, which kind of, you know, is, is maybe an extension of what you all were just describing. And that is the impact so far of your plan, um, you know, just identifying some additional outcomes or results as a result of this um, process that you've gone through. And maybe it's just uh, maybe something you didn't accomplish, but maybe some progress that you've seen that really makes you hopeful and excited for what may, what's ahead. Well, before uh, you know, Patrick is gonna talk a little bit about, I think some big picture stuff, but one thing that I would say is that uh, this is kind of a more of a micro example, um, but one of the things we worked on really rejuvenating was our, our learning walk so that our look fors are really uh, focused around um, best practices to produce the skills that we talk about in our, in our portrait. And, you know, you talk about adaptability, communication, uh, you know, empathy and those sorts of things. And I was out every, every Monday I go out and um, visit a school. Usually a, a, I have a school board member that'll come with me. This, this Monday, we had our um, county executive uh, join me. And um, I was at a middle school on Monday and outside the door to uh, the, it was, a, it was a science classroom, but they were, um, had, uh, it, was, it looked like it was more like an advisory time where everybody was all mixed up. And outside the door, there was a white, little whiteboard and it talked about the project that they were working on currently. 
and it was called the Space Settlement Project. And under the space, and so this was where students were um, studying and preparing for when they needed to create new settlements out in space. And so um, and that's not unusual. So you, you, you know, we've all heard of these projects that the kids do and they're fun and the teachers come through and they count beans, you know, did you use 10 popsicle sticks? Did you do this, do that? Not really what I would call a learning experience. But what excited me was how um, there were essential questions about the project that were that really caused students to uh, think about at, things at an evaluation level and an analysis level, but also all there were standards of learning listed for all the standards of learning that were that were integrated into the project. And when students were evaluated, they evaluated each other on. Uh, for example, they had to create a, a settlement with different housing units that created their own power, created their own energy. And I sat down with some students and they had developed this uh, a water wheel and they had to test the water wheel. So they had to figure out how to run water under the water wheel. And they talked to me and I said, well, did it work? And you know, two of them said, no, it didn't work at all. There's no gender. And one of them uh, corrected the other two and talked about this infinitesimal small amount of electricity it generated. So it did work and they were arguing with each other. And I said, well, how did it uh, score on the rubric that, uh, you know, that y'all agreed on? And they said, well, it, it didn't really work and we're not sure it's environmentally sustainable, but on aesthetics, it scored high, <laughs> you know? And there was a fine arts, um, one, of the, uh, one of the standards of learning was a fine arts uh, standards of learning. So. You know, when I see that, when I see, and not only that, Karen, but, you know, the thing is, no adults were needed to supervise the kids working in these groups doing this work. And the teacher and I had plenty of time to talk about what they were doing, engaging the county executive, and he's watching this and he's like, wow, I, you know, look at the work that our kids are doing. These kids are going to be great. You know, I want to hire them. I wanted them, them to work in the county. And I'm excited to bring employers here that are going to see these kinds of skills in our students. But the, the best part for me was they were work, they would have worked on that all day, uh, whether somebody was supervising them or leaning over them or not. And they were super excited to show everybody that came in the room uh, the projects that they were working on and just having a lot of fun with it too. So I know there's big, there's, there's measures we make, there's assessments, there's all that other stuff. But when I can walk into a school and see kids doing that kind of work, I know that the plan is having an impact. So Pat, I know you, you've got a lot of other stuff to talk about. Yeah, I, you know, a couple of it, you know, so this is um, year one for us with the plan. So we're getting ready in, in just a couple of weeks here to um, to give our, our first state of the division around this plan. So a lot of our data is baseline data uh, where we're, we're really using it as a jumping off point. But some of the strategies that I've seen that have been really impactful uh, include a, uh, a kind of a revamping of our school improvement planning process. Um, where, you know, I, I really think, and I think Matt would agree, that the school improvement plans are really the heart of, of what is going to drive us forward, what's happening in our schools and how well we're implementing our plan and moving it forward. And, and prior to this plan, uh, I think it was really kind of hit or miss how well those plans were written and, and how much dust they gathered on a shelf instead of really being in, uh, an active document. And so what we, one of the changes that we made that we thought has been, uh, has really received positive feedback and I think really moved our schools forward is we made it a collaborative process. So every one of our principals is paired in a, in a triad, a group of three principals, and they come together and they work collectively on their plans. Now they don't have the same plan for each school, each of their schools is different, um, but it gives them time to, to work in a PLC with people who do their same job that they just didn't get uh, to do very often. You know, we all know how, uh, how isolating the, the principalship can be um, in a school. And so having those, uh, those folks come together and they meet each month at each other's schools and walk the schools and, and kind of talk through problems of practice and see what's working well and what's, um, and what's not. And then each quarter, we bring together a larger comprehensive team with each one of those triads that includes 
our Office of Technology and our equity specialists and our Office of Instruction and our strategic planners and our special educators uh, to really collectively look at how things are going and, um, and where, uh, where folks need support and help removing barriers to that. Um, one of the other things that we've, that we've started to build out are we've always looked at um, uh, an equity dashboard in the division, right? To see how, uh, to what degree all of our students are really succeeding. But, we, but it was rare that we would drill that down to the school level. And so one of the strategies that came out of the strategic plan was developing school-based equity dashboards. And so now uh, principals can have live data they can go in and look at to see where are our students? Uh, because quite frankly, there uh, were some schools that could pretty easily mask um, some of our underperforming populations because they had uh, a lot of kids who were doing well uh, in the school and that made it look like everyone was doing just fine when in fact there were really mm -hmm. some, uh, some significant gaps there. Uh, so I'd say those two are, are really um, some important ones. And one of, the, one of the last things that we did that the plan really pushed us to do was start using some nationally normed tools to really um, gauge where we are compared to others in the nation. And we would, so, so one of those is the Panorama um, Student Support Survey. Uh, we would give climate surveys ourselves all the time and kind of pat ourselves on the back because it would come back and we'd say, hey, this looks pretty good, but we wouldn't really have anything to compare it to. Uh, and last year we started giving the Panorama Survey and we see that there's certainly some areas where we, we might look like we're doing okay, but compared to national norms, uh, we've, we've got a little bit of work to do. Uh, the other uh, tool that we've used uh, for that is the Gallup survey uh, around staff engagement uh, and employee engagement. And that was mm -hmm. one we piloted for the first time last year and has really given us some, uh, some areas of focus um, and our principal some areas of focus for where we want to move to make sure we've got, uh, you know, one of the elements of our strategic plan is retaining and hiring the highest quality staff we can. And that engagement survey is one of the tools that's going to tell us uh, how likely folks are to uh, to stick around here now tomorrow. That's really important. We just completed a study for the Texas Federation of Teachers about how do we improve the pipeline. And the number one, the kind of the key theme that came out of that is compensation matters, but working conditions matter even more. And so that's really good that you're assessing kind of their level of engagement um, to, to the district. Um, another thing that I like about your plan, it's what we typically um, try to support in districts through our strategic planning process is we don't like the old traditional plans, we don't tie a metric to every single strategy or activity in a plan. Uh, because it can get you so fragmented and it's really not the way things really work. You know, you can measure one outcome. It's probably the result of several, several things that you've done. So we try to group metrics around bigger chunks of work, usually around a strategy or a major goal. And I noticed that was uh, the way your plan has been designed. And so I'd love for you to talk about how, what do you think about that approach? Is it working for you all? And then how are you telling your story about progress on your, your plan, even how you're reporting that to the board, for an example? Yeah, so so that's uh, so I think that's great. You know, I was just counting up as we as we prepare for the state of the division, all of our different strategies and um, objectives and metrics that we've got in there. And there are dozens um, of each one. But but you're right, Karen, that we we de very deliberately didn't want to say here's strategy number one, and here's the metric that goes along with that. Mm -hmm. We really group those by our objectives of thriving students and empowered communities and, um, and equitable resources. Uh, because we feel like, uh, to your point, uh, you know, we're in a system that, that one thing isn't really going to change that. It's all of these things collectively. And we really need to have more than just one or two data points to show us where we are. And so we've got um, that divided up into some what we call some key metrics and some some that are a little bit softer that are there. But one of the questions we had was, well, how will we report on this? This is a huge plan and the board and the public are going to want to know what we're doing and where we're going for that. So um, so we've built out uh, we're getting ready to launch a, um, a web page for learning for all that is we kind of based it on our. our um, uh, uh, idea for this came from the Virginia school quality profiles, where in Virginia, you can go in, you can pick any division, you can pick any school, and you can dig into some really interactive metrics that are there. And so we wanted to build a tool that would report on learning for all in a similar way. And so what we've done is built one out that takes um, our 
three objectives for each one of our, uh, our three strategies for each one of the goals, opens up each strategy and then says, here's what we did in the 21-22 school year, and just has a bulleted list of, of some steps we took to meet that strategy. And then it's got a page where you can click on any one of our objectives and, uh, and as interactive as, as we can make it, um, you can go in there and you can manipulate it. That's where you can go into our equity dashboard and you can pick, uh, you can look at our equity dashboard as a division uh, and then you can drop down every single school that we have and see if we're seeing differences at each individual school. Uh, we, um, we have, uh, you know, all kinds of, I mean, there's dozens and dozens of, of different metrics that are in there from grades to capital funds to um, uh, hiring uh, and retention rates and how well we're doing on making our, uh, our instructional staff look like our student body uh, in the school system. And so we wanted to have something that would be, it's, we're not keeping it live, we're keeping it as a, as a one year snapshot, but now we're gonna have five years in a row. We've got a five year strategic plan where we can start to see that build. One of the other things that we, um, that we asked um, Mr. Page and the board to do recently is help us set targets. Uh, you know, that oftentimes we would come in and we'd say, well, here's where we are. And we would, we would kind of walk away from it and we'd come back next year and we'd say, here's where we are. Uh, and, we, and we wouldn't really say that we had met a target or had not because we hadn't set them. And so one of the things that we did just a couple of weeks ago was we sat down around student achievement and we did a work session with the board where we asked the board, where would these metrics need to be in five years for you all to say that we've met our mission of, uh, of eliminating the predictive value of race, class, gender, and special capacity on student success. And so the board really got engaged with that, um, helped us set some targets, and now we've got uh, uh, kind of a plan over the next five years to see whether we're on track with that or not. And I think that's going to be uh, really helpful. You know, one of the things that I think is really crucial about a strategic plan is the accountability factor, right? Are we, are we really going to hold ourselves to this um, and make it a part of our, of our work every day? Yeah, I really like um, how you talked about that and how those are grouped because really they help you tell a story of progress, right? But also where are you going? And I think those two coupled together, the progress plus, you know, what does success look like, which it sounds like your board has, has helped you kind of shape, which is I think is a great way of, of telling your story of, of success. Um, so anything else that we didn't talk about that you thought was important around the strategic planning process? or any advice you might have? I know we have a number of people listening in right now. What advice would you have for them around how they might approach or think about embarking on a strategic planning process? What do you think, Mr. Page? I wanna make sure you get some airtime here. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, I think our strategic plan, our board and our central office staff, I think we all, are really proud of the things that we have accomplished in the past in our mile county but one really important thing that i think our strategic plan shows to us is that we still have a whole lot of work to do we can't sort of rest on our laurels so that would be one thing that i think that um any division could sort of use that it's okay to be happy and proud of what you've done in the past but you'll have to move forward and continue to try to do better things and improve things so that's one takeaway that I have from uh, from our work with the strategic plan. You know what that makes me think of? You know, that old saying that the world is changing so fast that if you're not changing, you're automatically getting worse. Right, right. <laughs> right? Yeah, losing ground. Have, have, I like the way you said that, Mr. Page. You have to keep mm -hmm. keep working at it, right? Mm -hmm. and, and getting better at the same time, you can still be really proud of the progress you've made. And yes, you, you've been a wonderful system for so many years. And it's really wonderful to hear you all articulate this kind of continue this really this uh, value of continuous improvement um, in a really dramatic way. And Matt, well, anything that we left, any advice you would have, Matt or so Patrick? One tool that uh, that we developed. So one thing I would say, the other piece of advice is that um, you probably can't see it very well. There it is. This is our budget, and it has the same title as our strategic plan. So. The, the advice that I would have is that your budget is your strategic plan, that everything that is in the in your budget, in your spending plan should should tie back to uh, the overarching goals and strategies and metrics that you've got in your strategic plan. 
And when we, when we're working on our funding requests, which is all year, but we start to get pretty focused now for, for next year, when we are looking at uh, new expenditures that we haven't had in the past that we, that we want the board to take a look at and consider, uh, everyone is charged with developing a logic model for the, for the initiative or what we call a proposal. And so for example, um, one of the things we wanted to make sure to have equity, which is one of our values and be sure that our, our students thrive is that we, wanted, we, we have a baseline field, field trip experience for all of our students so that um, everybody has a guaranteed viable field trip experience. And so in doing that, I mean, you're gonna spend three quarters of a million dollars out of the budget. So there's some accountability around developing the inputs that you need, the activities, the outputs, and the outcomes. And then what we do is we track that logic model uh, according to the dates that we establish in there for each phase along the way. And the uh, owner of the uh, proposal or the initiative, if it's funded, uh, comes back to the cabinet on a frequent basis to update us on, you know, have you, have you if there were positions that needed to be hired, did you hire them? Uh, and if, if there were particular activities or material you needed to uh, acquire, did you do that? And how talk about the progress you're making. And then when we get to the point where we've reached the, the long, long-term outcomes, we pick a date on the calendar about three years out where we're gonna do a program evaluation. And so I think that uh, for um, a strategic plan to really come off the shelf, it has to be integrated with your uh, spending plan. I, I think you're so wise. I mean, it should be your, it, your budget should be allocated according to your priorities mm -hmm. and your priorities should be reflected in your strategic plan. So that makes so much sense the way you describe that, Matt. I mean, and, and I think the other thing is, I think we all know that if you don't have a systemic approach to this work, it's never gonna be equitable. Mm -hmm. uh, and so what you're describing also is making sure that the system is lined up to this to your strategic plan. Patrick, anything else that we didn't talk about? Yeah, that, the, the, uh, the last thing I would say, and this is really uh, stealing some thunder from, from what, what Matt would say quite often in our meetings, is that I think it's important to remember that this isn't your first strategic plan that you've got in your division and it won't be your last. It's really about what's important to you and your community and your school division right now. And, and as, we, as we got some, uh, some feedback and sometimes some pushback on the development of this plan, we had to keep that in mind, right? That, uh, that this, was, uh, this plan reflects what was most important to our community right now. Five years from now, that might be different uh, when, we, when we come back to, uh, to start from scratch and, and build another plan around this. And it's okay uh, to not have to, to not include uh, the kitchen sink uh, in, in the plan, but, but what do you really wanna get focused on your community? And in five years, where do you wanna be? Or seven years, however long your plan is, uh, that's, gonna, that's gonna really have an impact on you, your students, your staff, and your whole community. And Patrick, you brought up something that I think is really important that we try to coach districts from doing, and that is including everything they're doing in their plan. And sometimes you really have to coach your team to help them understand because they, you know, they're doing great work, important work. And if it's not re reflecting the strategic plan, they feel like they've been slighted a little bit, but that's not the purpose of a strategic plan. It should be the big moves, the big changes that you want to make. Keep doing the daily work that, that's lined up to that, that's, that's moving you forward. But what are the big moves, right, uh, that you want to make? Because you described that, I, th I think, way, really well. We had a question from an audience member, uh, Matt, that they were really interested in your logic model. Is that something that um, you would be willing to share with the audience or... You know, how, how, how did, or did, can you tell us a little bit more about how you approach that? Oh, sure. Uh, but it's, um, and it, we didn't invent it, that's for sure. Um, so you could, I mean, we just started Googling logic model <laughs> and there's all, you know, there's all kinds of variations yes. of it, but the key is to identify um, benchmarks for implementing, uh, a, you know, um, a strategy. So, but the thing is, I tell people, all, and I know I'm, I get boring with some of the stuff I say, but 
the thing is, it's not going to happen if you don't if you don't get the, the resources you need, and then it's cert, it's not going to happen if you don't do the activities. And so, being sure to measure the activity level, I think, is almost, is really to me the most important thing because. It's great, yeah, you wanna achieve the targets, you wanna achieve the goals, but if you don't do the things in the right order to the, to the depth that you said you, you were going to do them and ensure fidelity in carrying out the process, you're not gonna to get to the point where you get the results. And um, so we will, uh, I think Patrick just dropped our, uh, our, did you drop the budget in there? I dropped in a, um, a blank logic map template um that we that we use for the budget and i set it up to make a copy so if um if it doesn't open for some reason let me know and i'll send a um uh a better one yeah and then you know the other piece that i would say about it is the frequent meetings to check in with people on where they are and it's not um the purpose of it is not to uh, uh you know rake people over the coals over their progress it's it's you know help us understand where you are and if you're stuck what do you need to, to keep moving? And, um, you know, this goes back uh, about three years, but one of the things we we're working on right now is this career learning community that we're spreading all the Virginia career clusters across our high schools. And one of the first moves we were making was to start, um, it's a National Defense Corps, but it, you know, it's the, it's the term for the junior ROTC when you're funding it yourself at, at Monticello High School. So the, the guys that were working on that put together a logic model. And um, you know, one of the first things obviously was to uh, hire, uh, hire someone to run it. And so anyway, we get all this in place. The board approved the budget in uh, February, the county approves it. And I'm, and I'm telling people, all right, everybody get out there, start hiring, start hiring. And then we have a meeting in June and pulled in the, the two the uh, directors that were working on it. And they, there was, it was really when we were just starting to use the logic model approach. In the past, this, this meeting would have never happened. We would have just assumed everybody was doing what, what we uh, said they were gonna do and then figure out later on doing a post-mortem, like yeah. why it didn't happen. And we sat down with them and we're like, okay, where are you on this right now? And there were several steps that they had not completed mm -hmm. in the order and it was it was a great wake up call. It was like, okay, so you're not there now. So how do we all pull together uh, to make sure that we can get to where you need to be right now to get this started? And it, it got started on time. It's it's been a thriving project at one of our high schools that the other students can attend. But in the past, you know, years ago, we'd all put in these initiatives. The board would look at them, they'd fund them, and it was like we no there was never be asked about it again. And uh, sometimes we'd all look at each other and say, hey, did we ever carry that initiative? Well, we can't, you know, this is, this is funding we're bringing in from the public to take on these projects. So we need to make sure they happen for the benefit of the kids. So that, that I think is, my, is a couple of pieces of advice around logic models. As you can tell, I'm passionate about logic models. And Matt, I also just dropped in a couple pages of our um, budget book that has the logic models that we completed in there and Thanks, I see, okay uh, that's, that's great thank you patrick that i think the first one they couldn't open so this is yep, wonderful that thank, one you. Back into. thank you for your willingness to share i, I will tell you that there, you're right logic models a lot of different kinds you can use approaches you can use we use them too at Batal for kids what's nice is it really gives you the discipline to really be thinking about how a particular approach would line up to your strategic plan the impact it would have and the resources needed uh, and who does it touch, right? Who does it touch and, and what kind of outcomes you're expecting? So I uh, really appreciate you sharing that example and, and willing to share the, the resource online. So thank you all so much for your willingness to share. Uh, it was a delight with Patel for Kids. You know, we, we just feel so honored and privileged to have the opportunity to be to work with you all uh, in Albemarle County Schools and for all that you do, uh, you're wonderful leaders and you're doing some really courageous and important work. So thank you for taking the time from your busy days uh, to be with us today. I also wanna especially thank your school board chair for joining us today. You know, you, you mentioned earlier, a lot of these really important pieces of work, portrait of a graduate, strategic plan, 
you need the board uh, to really be um, supportive of that work and for them to be in, so involved. So thank you, uh, Mr. Page, for being with us today and for your service on your on the school board. Um, yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Dr. Gaza, for all of your assistance and help with our division over the last year, many years. And thanks to Patel also for everything that you've uh, helped to guide our system through. Thank you very much. Thank you. We appreciate that. We appreciate that. Um, for those of you that want to learn more, and Matt, I was going to say uh, thank you to you and Patrick and your wonderful team uh, for giving us the opportunity to, to be uh, a small part of, of your strategic planning process. It was, like I said, a delight to work with you all. It, for anyone on the that was listening today, if you're interested in learning more about the way we approach the strategic planning process, I think it maybe was evident to those who were listening that we do approach this in a little bit different way than a lot of organizations do. And that's based upon our experiences being in the seat and in the role. Um, and because we we think the portrait of a graduate is such important work to advance across this country. And so that's why the way we why we approach it the way we do. If you want to learn more about it, there's a QR code uh, right on your screen, or you can certainly email um, Jeff, who can, can direct you in the right way, or you can email or reach out to me, kgarza at batelforkids.org. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. And again, thank you to the team at Albemarle. Thank you, Matt, Patrick, and Mr. Page. We appreciate you all being with us today. And thank you for all you do for Ed Leader 21 and Batel for Kids. We appreciate you. Thank you, Dr. Garza. We love, we love working with you. So it's our pleasure. Thank you. Absolutely.